Well, hot damn. Greetings, everyone. Tiki here, talking about John Campia's new documentary film, Movie Trailers, A Love Story. That's right, we've got Blue Dragon 5 with us tonight. How you doing, Dragon? I'm very thankful. All right, so yes, uh, John Campia, of course, If uh, for anyone who doesn't know, I'm sure most, like, nine... Like, 99% of what people watching this are going to know who Campy is. But uh, John Campy, of course, a movie pundit journalist. Uh, he's been online since the good old days of the movie blog. I followed him all the way from the AMC Movie Talk days of yore. Uh, Dragon, it's practically a meme at this point that a lot of people discovered him through his Man of Steel review. He's one of the biggest champions of Man of Steel. And, of course, he's kind of, like, spun off and been doing his own thing with YouTube for a while now. Uh, uh, him and Robert Meyer Burnett host a movie talk show together. And, uh, Dragon, I gotta say, uh, Campia, you know, he's, uh, he's definitely one of the most outspoken people in the, uh, in the film journalism sphere on YouTube. But I really respect that about the, him. I've always respected that about him. He's, uh... You know, he's not, he maybe might not be the most agreeable person, but he's always one of the most passionate people in this sphere. So with that in mind, Dragon, of course, uh, this is a project that I've been following for a while. Uh, I didn't know about this from the inception, Dragon. Unfortunately, I didn't get to uh, crowdfund this because I kind of found out about this uh, essentially like, a couple months before Campia released his trailer, he kind of just briefly mentioned it on his show, and I was like, wait, what? Campia's doing a documentary about trailers? That sounds awesome. Oh, man. And uh, so, yeah, I, I saw the trailer. The trailer was uh, just really, really got my attention. And what I love about this thing, Dragon, kind of going into my uh, thesis statement on it, is I just, I really love how much this breaks everything down. This is really just kind of a... Uh, it really feels like an essay in the best of ways. I say that as a compliment. It feels like a really, really well-structured essay where uh, it's going through all these different points along the way, along the journey of the evolution of the trailer. It's given this kind of like uh, this really thoughtful sort of, uh, you know, sort of history, but also the, the, the relationship with the fans. And that's where this movie really shines, I think. Anyways, Dragon, uh... We're going to go not beat by beat through this movie, but definitely chapter by chapter, because Gampia has this movie arranged into 12 chapters, if you will. So we're going to break every one of them down. Um, it'd be inaccurate to say that's spoiler talk, but by the same token, there might be some people who want to just go into this documentary as blind as possible and don't want to really know the talking points before they get to them. If that's the case, by all means, we'll give you our spoiler-free thoughts for, you know, the next five minutes or so. Before diving in, you can get a nice ten-minute review out of it. Uh, but rest assured, folks, we are going to dive deep into this thing, because I think there's a lot of really good talking points here, and I'm really excited to talk about it. Because, Dragon, I like I said, I really do think uh, in a year that we've had a lot of great entertainment-based documentaries, of course, for us, the big one, the gold standard, is the Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy, Ren and Stimpy documentary. But we've got a lot of other good ones. The Orange Years just dropped, of course, on Disney+. Plus. Uh, well, I guess uh, the Imagineering story was 2019. But still, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of really excellent entertainment-based documentaries this year. It's kind of been a renaissance for that. And I honestly think this one stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them. What do you right, think, right, Dragon? Right. All right. So, um... <laughs> Okay, so movie trailers a love story. Yeah, I went into this one. Uh, you know, I went into this one very clean. I, um, I knew nothing about this. Basically, I didn't find out about it until you kind of you sent me the poster, which I mm -hmm. thought was really eye catching. It was really inventive. It was the uh, basically you kind of like the little green, like you know, this movie is rated this or appropriate for this audience. You know, the classic green and white. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that kind of captured my interest in the topic of oh, the movie trailers, and it's a uh, structure. Uh, the poster looks a little bit like a movie trailer. I'm fine. Oh, John Campion, this he's he, you know he was a uh, John John Schnepp's buddy. Okay, I kind of know that guy. Yeah, you know, I'm glad I'm glad you brought up Schnepp times. because of course Schnepp did uh did the Rise of Superman documentary, or I'm sorry, the the Death of Superman Lives, Death of Superman Lives, yes. uh, which again is is also that's a that's a gold standard for documentary in itself. Good stuff. And that one, I, I was I was lucky enough to crowd upon that one, but I hear you. I was, I, I was also in that from pretty much the beginning, from the inception of that on the AMC Movie Talk days. So yeah, I saw the evolution of that one. 
Certainly. So that's the thing. So Campy, I'm really, I, I only know Campy from the times you've kind of brought him up or you've recommended something by Campy. I mean, I'm not intimately familiar with the man. I just know he does, I, I hear he does good work. And again, from the little bit I've seen, he sounds pretty, sounds pretty much like he knows what he's doing. I can get behind that guy a little bit, you know. I mean, I wouldn't lie if over the years I haven't kind of modeled my approach to uh, doing commentary in the Disney community, much like Campia does his approach to doing commentary in the movie community. You know, very outspoken, very brash, you know. Uh, but I, I kind of embrace that about myself, and I embrace that about Campia as well. Sure. So again, so, you know, I see the poster for this thing, uh, you know, Campy does carry a little bit of cachet with him, but predominantly, you know, I mean, I'm always, I always love a good documentary, especially again, after, you know, some of the strings of successes we had, I mean, literally right before this, I had watched the orange year. So I was definitely in a documentary mood. So this oh, was a, kind of goodness. the right time, definitely the right time for it. Uh, and I got to tell you, my, my thoughts on this, my non-spoilery thoughts are, uh, Campia really impressed me with this. He really yeah, did. Yeah. I, um, I'm really amazed at how, at, at how um, basically at, at how uh, how he bro how he um, broached the topic so thoroughly and uh, d digestibly at the same time with the twelve chapters and uh, all of this covered so much ground. Basically, we really analyzed the topic in twelve points in an hour and twenty minutes very well. I'm really I'm really impressed structurally how he approached this. How kind of the themes tie into each other, if not if not directly, then at least thematically, and they kind of harken back to earlier points that he made. So again, very. Very well put together, very well edited. Um, again, just the, an hour and twenty minutes. I mean, that's 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 it's really impressive to me. I mean, if you want to be all, if you want to be that guy, like like an hour, like an hour and eighteen <laughs> minutes. But yeah, <you> know. <laughs> right. That's what I'm saying. So you know, the trailer uh, basically, you know, it just made sense. This project. The thing that also kind of captured my mind. I think Campy did not waste it all here. Is that you know, trailers are bigger than they've ever been these days. Uh, you know, we. You know, we either praise or, you know, it's, we always praise and complain about trailers, but never do we truly ask why. Why do we have trailers? Why are trailers important? Why do we need this about trailers? Why do we praise trailers? Why do we complain? It's never the why. We're just living in the moment of the reaction. That's kind of where we're at usually on, on the trailers. We're always thinking about, our, about it in our own little worlds. We never kind of like kind of go back and just kind of look at kind of the exploded version of it, which Campy has done. Uh, very well here in this documentary, I, I feel uh, does very well. So basically, folks, ringing endorsement from us, I'd say, in kind of our opening, kind of our opening segment here. I mean, it's going to hey, be Dragon. Bright. I just want to speak on something you said about it being digestible, which I, I absolutely agree. You know what this reminds me of in terms of the digestibility of it all is it reminds me of the people versus George Lucas uh not necessarily in terms of subject matter but in terms of just how watchable this thing is man um and also definitely kind of a fan kind of uh, kind of a fan laden experience as well sure sure of course of course but I, I I'm not I'm not gonna lie I've watched this thing three times and uh you know I probably would have watched it at least twice even if it weren't for the podcast in the same day because I was just really sucked into it and I was just like oh man like those were damn good points. You know, it's structured really well. We got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of really good talking heads in it, as well as uh, just great editing and a good narration, good structure, like you said. So overall, it just flows really well as a documentary, man. It just, uh, you know, it's just compulsively watchable, in my opinion. Sure, and and again, uh, again, when you have a really good documentary, it's going to be rewatchable. Because again, I would rewatch, you know, the People versus George Lucas all the time. I still do, heck, you know. So it's, uh, I absolutely hear you on that. I could see myself rewatching this as well. But again, folks, it's, uh, why well, I already did it twice. I mean, I could see it watching it further going down there. But you know what I mean. Um, so again, folks, uh, again, pretty much we're an endorsement. Again, it's going to be around Black Friday or like Black Friday weekend or whatnot around the time this has come out. So by all means, I mean, I'd, I'd look into it, folks. I mean, you're going to be on Amazon anyway. Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you enrich right, your right. lives? Enrich mm -hmm. your lives while you're there. You know, <laughs> give this film some attention. And just right. one more thing I just want to speak to with uh, Campia's directing style is I really respect the decision for him to completely remove himself from it in the narrative. You know what I mean? He, like, you, his fingerprints are all over it in terms of, like, you feel his passion, you feel his, uh, you know, his drive, but I really respect that he's disconnected from the talking heads, that this is definitely his baby. This is definitely his passion project. Yeah, he very easily could have, like, been one of the talking heads, and the closest uh -huh. thing we get to Campia is, like, we see a clip of one of his other movies. That's the closest we get to Campia. <laughs> right, right. But, uh, but yeah, I just, I really, I really respect that decision on an artistic level because to me, it's like almost an interesting, uh, an interesting counterbalance 
to the Death of Superman Lives, which the Death of Superman Lives, Dragon, was by all intents and purposes a, uh, you know, an extension of Schnepp's personality. You know what I mean? It, he's front and center in that movie. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing at all. We just said it was a gold standard for documentaries. Uh, but it is a very interesting contrast when you break down both the men's uh, documentary work. And I'm sure that the Schnepp documentary at least had some sort of influence on Campia, if not just in terms of a I gotta get out and do it kind of a way. So, uh, all right, so yeah, Dragon, let's uh, let's transition into the chapters, if you will, folks. Uh, like I said, this isn't necessarily going to be spoilers, but we are going to talk through some, you know, some good talking points that get brought up much more eloquently in the film itself than what our, us two schmucks can discuss. So, um, you know, and we're kind of going to break down the themes of the movie. So if you don't want to, if you don't want any of that ruined for you, I'd probably stop watching here. But alas, Dragon, you ready to dive into this thing? Yeah. All right. So, chapter one, importance. So, by the well, way, another thing about this oh, too, I got, I got, I got such a sense that uh, Campia. This feels so much like Campia wrote a book and he's adapted the book into a documentary, <laughs> doesn't it? Totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. look, I know chat. Other things can have chapters for sure, but I'm just saying it feels like this feels so fleshed out. It feels so. Plus, some of the interviews feel like they would have also given these interviews, and you know, for a book, especially Chris Gore, one of my favorite guys, is in this movie. But uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, chapter one, importance. We love trailers, but do they make a difference? So, Dragon, essentially, this is just the uh, the brief thesis statement of the movie, which is just, uh, you know, I, by the way, I love that Scott Mance is the first talking head that we see. That just feels very appropriate. As one of your guys, you, you, you Scott love the Mance. Scott Mance is my guy, man. I will I will champion the Mance. That I guy, gore you got that guy has a screen presence to him. He does, <laughs> he does. I gotta admit, I mean, there, there's a line we walk with Mance here. I think, ultimately, there's on the first watch, it's like, man, it looks like we just got Mance for all the Star Trek stuff. On the rewatch, though, no, no, we got him in there for a bunch of other stuff. Point being, oh. Mance is the man, for sure. Dragon, I just one quick sideline with Mance. I will never forget walking into a, uh, oh god, what are the, the Fathom events. Walking yeah. into one of the Fathom events and Mance is there on the big screen. I'm like, that was surreal, Dragon. I had no idea. I've he only was gone to this. two Fathom events, and I believe he was there for, <laughs> I know he was there for at least one of them. I don't know, uh -huh. if, not in person, obviously, but I mean, he was on the screen, but you know. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know. Obviously, I don't know the man personally, Dragon. But kind, I, I kind of had a reaction. I, my grandma was there, and I kind of had like an, "Hey, there's my buddy." Oh, God. <laughs> Anyways, anyway, so uh, basically, uh, so what we do in the importance chapter overall is we're evaluating kind of the practical impact of the trailer, and we use a lot of, of the, this documentary has various great examples to prove their points. Uh, I, I, I feel like, for example, Venom was a great example. Of uh, basically how hype would sell a film, where Venom, really, you know, hype worthy trailer, people want to see Venom again and done better than Topher Grace. And, uh, you know, we kind of, we, you know, we demonstrate this, and whether critically it ends up, it turned out well, it made a lot of money thanks to that trailer. It really kind of, again, people want symbiote, man. They, they live for the symbiote, and it was well represented in that trailer. I was one of those fans where it's like, I, you know, I going into Venom, I, I did not care one way or another how good the reviews were. I just wanted to see the symbiote, man, so I totally, I'm totally with you. <laughs> Here's the thing that really impressed me on the rewatch, or at least, you know, kind of, you're kind of factoring it, and then you really kind of think about it on the rewatch. Um, I love how Alcampi is setting things up and working backwards from said premise here. Uh, he's kind of in this, I, mean, I know he's not directly working backwards. Basically, he presents it in, at, at the top here, and then basically all the other segments are in service of the importance question. You know, as we're kind of deconstructing and working backwards for all the elements, the problems, and the, and the high points that kind of factor into why a trailer is important, which I thought was really, thought was really good. Right, right. Like uh, they show, you know, sometimes a bad trailer can can tank a movie, and then we just get the cut to the uh, the emoji movie, the meh. That was a great edit. Yeah, like all the stuff that goes into the response of a trailer, with you know, like you know, the you know, kind of chapters, you know, going into the fall. Basically, the, the the chapters that follow are all all about how we broach the makeup of the trailer. How does uh -huh. the trailer come together historically, as well as just kind of and then like the you know the editing and the sound and. And of course, just kind of the response, like all these elements really kind of you know, kind of come together. Also, we have an example of a uh, of uh, we have a really on point example with Dread of an example where again, trailer is you know the, the movie is great, the trailer is also great, but unfortunately, sometimes it just uh, you know hype hype will not help you. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, Dragon, before we get too deep into this, I just want to mention the one thing that they didn't really go into at all that I was kind of disappointed by, because I think it's, uh, I, I think it is a little bit of a, you know, of a foot, not, it's more of, more than a footnote. Uh, I think it's kind of like the in between between the uh, the movie trailer voice guy and then the uh, the the cover songs. Dragon, where was the womp? I know. Where was I, was, the womp I, was, of I, was gonna, I thought we were going to build to it when we got to the music, but yes, Tiki, where is the womp? <laughs> that, that's the one thing that I felt like. I, I, I'm sure maybe it got lost in the cutting room floor, you know. And there's already a lot of really good points being made, but uh, that's the one thing I was waiting for that we never got to was the womp. Well, here's the thing. Okay, so I have a few nitpicks, and I want to cl classify the the main nitpick I have here. And this is like a, a nitpick you easily write off because it's kind of nitpick. Why didn't you use this clip or this example? Because there's a lot of examples in this one. Uh -huh, a lot of great uh -huh. examples. And I'm not knocking any of them, but I will say, and Dragon, of one course, I'm sure that there's a lot of examples that were used in the interviews that just got left on the cutting room floor. Exactly. You can only I mean, do I'm so sure much in an hour and twenty minutes. I'm sure there's a campia cut of this somewhere. Uh -huh. Release but, the campia cut. <laughs> un uncan the campia cut. <laughs> Right. Okay, no, but, but but seriously, like the, here's here's a nitpick. Uh, sorry, not again. Here's an example that I really felt uh, would have really helped. I don't know, maybe in this section or a little bit later, like during uh -huh. like you know, kind of like the trailers that uh, really disservice their movies. Uh, Iron Giant. I think that's a really historic. I think that's a really broachable example. Everyone would have maybe. Oh, I don't even before. remember the trailer for the Iron Giant. Well, that's the thing. Iron Giant had a terrible marketing thing. Where again, overall the marketing was very last minute because again they they were urged to wait until next year. But again, the movie and it tested great. Everyone loves Iron Giant. The movie reflected that. But unfortunately, uh, you know the, the the marketing did not. That basically the way the studio did the did the trailer was that it was like a really told you nothing about the heart or the soul of the movie anything about the likability that john was like it's like heavy metal oh god <laughs> remember it was like the whole like you know, this movie's gonna rock or something like, that. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just, like, like some heavy metal gag like oh he's a right. giant metal it, guy therefore like playing guitar music and everything's just completely not the iron john play the iron man song I mean, it was like the most on <laughs> version of the Iron Man song. Sure, it was. That's what I'm saying. That was like I think that's like uh, would have been a universal example that would have been great. And again, I've but I mean, like I said, Dragon, it, we we'd literally be here all all day. If we I were know, I know. I'm just saying that's why, I'm, that. <laughs> I, that's just why I'm digging into that one specific because of all the, <laughs> of the examples, that one felt like it's a really historic example. But fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so then uh, go ahead. Sorry, one last thing is another thing is overall it's really kind of uh, interesting about this is that we kind of talk about uh, how the trailer really uh, the success of a trailer equates to the first week's box office, which is an interesting idea. You don't really think about it. So if a trailer bombs, if a trailer like the whole Star Trek into the uh, not I think it was in the darkness, the third one, the third Star Trek movie, Star Trek Beyond. Beyond, yes, thank you, Star Trek Beyond, <laughs> the second one. Anyway, so Star, Star Trek Beyond to darkness was doomed from the get go. Trying well, to save that movie. I thought, I thought Cumberbatch was a good con, but that's just me. Anyway, <laughs> point being. Um, with, with Star Trek Beyond, of course, you get like movies that are kind of doomed because of the trailers. Uh, again, those trailers at, are equate for like the first week's box office, and of course, ideally, if things uh, it will pick up momentum, and then the movie will do great financially. So again, if a trailer doesn't perform, you're losing that 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 first boost and that first like the eye catching appeal. It's going to get butts in the seats and then get the good reviews going. If no one shows up to the movie because of that trailer, you're in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, so Chapter 2, History, Creation, The Jazz Singer, Hitchcock, and The In the World Guy. All right. So we uh, never talk about the genesis of, 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 um, of trailers. Uh, that's the thing. We usually, no one ever talks about the genesis of the trailers, living in the world in the moment with the trailers. So this segment was very informative, I felt. Yeah, I knew about the jazz singer. Obviously, I knew about the uh, the Hitchcock psycho mm -hmm. thing. That's the, I, I feel like... Exactly. Most people cite the, that is like one of the, uh, you know, one of the first times that a trailer was really artistically done, you know, with a very, very pointed uh, intention behind it. But, uh, yeah, uh, I had no idea about the early days of it and the, uh, you know, the NSA of it all and why they call it a trailer to begin with. And uh, everything like that. It was all very informative. I and, didn't know uh, there was a Marcus Lowe's. I gotta tell you, I did not know there was there there was a guy named Lowe's for the Lowe's. You know, 
Dragon, there's always a guy. There's I know. I, 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 I guess now, it's just, you kind of like it's one of those institutions you never really questioned it, you know? But there, yeah, you're right. There is always a guy. <laughs> oh, it makes it, but again, that's what I'm saying. This this section, this this chapter was really cool, man. It had a lot of, like, really informative things. Like, I mean, here's the thing. I'm always, I'm thinking about the Psycho Trail, which we got, but uh, you, you don't think about the Jazz Singer, which, of course, you know, kind of a big sound and film. That's a big deal. Watching the Jazz Singer trailer is kind of surreal because it's like, you know, it's one of those pieces of, like, really, really old media that's, like, very, almost kind of, like, out of time when you watch it, you know? Yeah, but I love, like, the light bulb moment that, again, we never talk about trailers. Like, how do we get a trailer? Well, again, it's, it's the, the, the the studios or, like, you know, more accurately, I guess, the theaters. I uh, just kind of get an idea of, like, hey, light bulb uh, with the distributors. Let's Let's gild the lily a little bit. Let's talk up the film. Let's get some buzz going. Let's let's show not not the thing itself. Let's show the rehearsals for the thing. Capture them on film so people can see this isn't what we're doing, but it's essentially what we're doing. And you want to see the end product, so come to our theaters. It'll be fun. Right, right. Makes sense. Oh, by one of my, we have a new interview. We have another uh, interviewer guy. He really, he, he's uh, here's the thing. He's kind of an unofficial historian. He's not a specifically a film historian, but the guy he, he functions like that. Robert uh, Meyer. Uh, uh, Robert Meyer Burnett, yeah, that guy. I really like that guy. He was good. Yeah, Robert, Robert Meyer Burnett guy, Dragon. If you if you like him, you'll like uh, Campia's show that he does weekly because he is uh, usually Campia's uh, co-host. Oh, it's kind of his Ed McMahon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think they've got a great rapport with one another. I really do. Yeah, I really like this guy. And again, like again, so he uh, he was my favorite along with Chris Gore in terms of. I mean, Mance is also great, but I mean, that's kind of what's like, water is wet. I mean, come on. So, yeah, right. right. Say, so, yeah, uh, Chris Gore is he always he's always like the go to historian from his Fangoria days, and he's pretty much in all like kind of the kind of the uh, kind of the Kickstarter uh, documentary greats like Doom, the the Fantastic Four, the, the Untold Story, of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four. He sure, pops sure. Up a lot. Yeah. I, I, I just like seeing Gore, and Gore actually brought the. Uh, not that he never brings it, but I say he brought extra when we get to certain segments later on. So the point being, these two guys, I thought, thought killed it and again served as kind of the historian kind of a role for the, uh, for the documentary with the interviews. Um, let's see. Okay, let's talk about Don. Donnie Boy. Let's talk about Don. <laughs> Donnie Boy. Uh, a Fontaine. So yes, we put in. I forgot that we. You know, here's the thing. We always know him from his moniker, like the inner world. And like Ryan Reynolds has built a business on the doing a doing an impression of the inner world guy. It's hilarious. Uh, literally, uh, there's another group that has built a business on the <laughs> on the on the inner world voice. But uh, yeah, this guy. The learning they did five thousand films, seventies and nineties, and of course we all three generations know about this man. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what I what I find interesting about the way that they use him in this documentary is that they kind of represent the cynical nature of the way that trends in movie marketing kind of come and go. You know, I I really love that point that was made about like, yeah, you know, people like he he was kind of run into the ground and people got sick of him, which is true. And you know, basically doing trailers that were simply just not the in the world in a world guy were almost I drink it I and I very specifically remember that I very specifically remember it would like really stick out like oh man this feels really cinematic you know and uh so uh you know but but basically they say uh the voiceover thing might come back again and it's very possible it's well, I, mean, just I think Ryan Reynolds should be our new in a world guy but that's just oh me though I'm I'm half I'm half joking with that, but you know, it's, but you're right though. The, we need the the inner world guy should come back. It's been too long. <laughs> it's like but, he's like the Billy Mays of uh, of movie trailers. Sure. Another thing, this comes back later, so I want to make a note of it now. Um, we have an interesting point here that directors of the '60s, at the latter point of the '60s, they cut their own trailers, which is big, which is huge, given how the industry is going to go and how rare that is. Like you know, like a Kubrick's cutting his own trailers, which again explains you know there there was some very solid marketing on those. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it kind of leads to uh, you know kind of the the dynamic that we have later on with the studios that we'll get into. So again, a, a lot of, uh, in the history of the trailers, this thing is really doing a great job of kind of sowing a lot of seeds for stuff that we're going to examine later on. Exactly. So that brings us to chapter three, the Phantom Menace. Oh, this is big. This is big dragon. Of course we knew all about this from, yeah. the, uh, from people versus George yeah. Lucas, but still it's nice to have it explored. Yeah, we it knew is... this except for one part. One part I was the one of my favorite parts of the documentary. Yeah. 
So, uh, this is great. So, one, of course, uh, Phantom Menace, basically this whole section is kind of the birth of, of the hype and event film trailer, if you will. But uh, right. I feel like we should do a Meet Joe Green podcast at some point. Okay, okay. two things. One, you completely interrupted my point. Secondly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not it's... Joe Green. What is it? Mean Joe Green's the, the Coke and a Smile guy. Oh, God. What, what Meet Joe Black? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. I don't I was going to build to my favorite thing in that thing. I love the whole... Uh, I love the reveal that uh, we never considered that... What was the movie that was sidled with the <laughs> Phantom Menace? <laughs> Meet Joe Black. And I just Meet felt so... Like, oh, Black. I never... Like, you never considered... Like, yeah, because, of course, in People vs. George Lucas, we always saw that people ran in the theater and sometimes they'd run out and just like, right, we just right, saw right. the trailer! They never thought, what did they go to see with, with that trailer? What poor movie, what poor sap got kind of the... I'm got, genuinely curious to explore that movie, Dragon. I, really I am too, because it looks good. Because <laughs> it, 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 I heard, like, a, I got a vague premise from it. I looked it up briefly. It was essentially... Uh -huh. uh, uh, God, I believe who I forget who the other guy in the movie is. I want to say it was uh, it was Brad Pitt, but I could be wrong. Um, Sounds right. I think it's Brad Pitt and Anthony Hopkins, and basically uh, uh, Brad Pitt's death, and Anthony Hopkins is the Joe Black character. So. Oh, that sounds really interesting, actually. I know, right? That's yeah. basically sounds like <laughs> you actually got to be with a, death, with a death figure. That's pretty much the premise from what I got in a brief snippet. But it's uh, it looks sounds really interesting, honestly. I'm just curious, like, of all movies, why that one to put with Star Wars? Well, that's timing, man. Again, it's just, like, it's whatever's coming out, like, in the proximity. I guess so. I guess Again, so. Again, this is before we have the marketing that we have now. We want movies that at least are in the same genre. They kind of get, they get the exactly. crowd in there. Yeah, if not, before. like, the MCU thing or, you know, like, back when Pixar movies used to have trailers for the next Pixar movie, back when that was a thing. Anyways, well, I think um, it's important to meet Joe Black. <laughs> so yeah, I, I really do. Uh, you know, we don't really dwell on the Phantom isn't menace of it all, but it is an important note to hit. You know, certainly, certainly is, and the big, the big takeaway as well. And this is what I love too, and just the way Campia kind of composed things here, especially thematically, and kind of our transition is that uh, I love how, of course, Phantom Menace essentially broke the internet before there was an internet, really. Right, right. And uh, essentially, that's kind of how we transition to the internet, where we remember how trailers kind of, you know, kind of changed, you know, going from theaters to in your phone, essentially, uh, and uh, you know, all the processing pattern, upload like a trail, like a bootleg trailer or something. You, you know, it, it took like you know six hours <laughs> or more. Uh, and that's I remember it. the days, Dragon Raimi's Sam Raimi's Spider Man trailer. Even Spider Man Two, I think, was uh, was in that vein. Oh, dude. but again, this kind of gives us, in some some sense, the birth of the QuickTime thing. I remember the QuickTime thing. Do you? Yes, yes, I remember QuickTime. It was QuickTime was like a nostalgic. Did we never talk about QuickTime anymore? Look at it. Ah. It was a good compromise, but still, it was uh, YouTube was a game changer, man. It really was. Again, another example. I don't know where he would have put it, but uh, the whole again, because anything, he, I know, I think I know it can't be. Can't be it went with famous because obviously it's the perfect one. It's the it's uh, probably the biggest trailer ever made in that regard. I would say so. Yeah, I so would I, say I, I get. I'm just saying. Yeah. 89 Batman had a really great... Here's the thing. I think on the whole, the, the thing that I, I wish Campia leaned into more, uh, which, I, I mean, he kind of does spurts of it a little, little later on. Uh, we don't talk about teaser trailers enough, for my money. I think we talk about just trailers, and we, we, we touch on teaser trailers a little bit. We do, but I, I don't know. The teaser trailer is a little, little unexplored real estate here, and I feel 89, Batman 89, would be the perfect teaser trailer. You know, it's a whole... We don't even say the title of the film. It's just the bat symbol... You know, uh, you know the June uh, nineteen eighty nine. Sure, sure. That was always like another historic trail, but obviously, Phantom Menace eclipses that by you know God knows how much. But yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, point being, we're talking about the internet, which transitions us to chapter four. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, like, like we said, Dragon, it's mostly about kind of that transition from watching in theaters to watching on YouTube. Now, Dragon, you were kind of uh, like you and me were starting to get to know each other when this was really becoming prominent. Where, you know, the YouTube stuff, like, they'd upload weeks before it would hit theaters, and now it's just, like, it's totally disconnected. I mean, God knows if I'll even see a new trailer in theaters anymore, you know? But, uh, but back in the day, man, I remember there was this slow, gradual transition from, like, oh, show up to such and such movie to get a trailer for Lord of the Rings Return of the King, or... You know, something like Pirates of the Caribbean, the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie, or 
uh, The Dark Knight. You know, it was very, very pointed. Like, it was very marketed kind of in that Meet Joe Black style, Dragon. We got that for a while. And and then the shift, uh, the shift definitely happened, I would say, around the dawn of YouTube. Like I said, YouTube is a game changer in that regard. Real quick, one more Meet Joe Black thought. Just pull oh, it on here. Uh, okay. it's just, you gotta imagine, though, I really want to know the box office of Meet Joe Black. Because think about it. Whether <laughs> people stayed for the movie or not, I mean, a lot of people went to see Meet Joe Black. So financially, that movie... <laughs> I'm just saying, be interested to see how much that made. At least on the opening weekend or something, it must have made a killing. Right. <laughs> just, just, it's, it's just an interesting thought I had watching the thing again with the Meet Joe Black. But anyway, sorry, yeah, but yeah, you're right. Uh, here's the thing, I like that, uh, again, another stylistic thing I think Campy really had going for him in this documentary, the whole, like, he did, like, these, kind of these montages, like, these, like, a top ten list of, like, the top ten most viewed trailers uh, of 2019. Which, of course, you know, of course, very fittingly, Endgame trumped the, uh, the Lion King live action movie. Oh, say, God. <laughs> Don't get me started. Thank goodness. But you see my point. It's kind of a nice little scene which just kind of you know, shows you kind of the how, how how big a business and trailers are with the viewership that it is now versus when it was quick time. And also just kind of talking about kind of the state of things. Again, this this uh, you know, tra- looking for new trailers and it's kind of a hype around trailers. Uh, it's kind of more relevant given the state of things in 2020. It's looking back a year. You know, it's kind of looking back to where we were with all this and just kind of looking at it now. It kind of makes you long for it. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, big player gets introduced this chapter. We meet the folks at Aspect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the tra- the go to trailer assembly house who made uh, probably my one of my favorite, definitely my favorite film of the last ten years, Deadpool. <laughs> my all time favorites as well. I mean, of course, I got a lot of attachment to the Deadpool movie. And they did the trailer for it. And of course, Deadpool is a very, very remarkable trailer. Yeah. So yeah, then we, basically these guys are like the modern examples of the last couple of modern trailers, like Shazam and stuff like that. Just the last couple of years, they, since 2016, just given little little snippets that we get as as per the example. Uh, they talk about the Sonic thing, of course, the trailer outcry, which basically in the age of the internet, everyone sees the trailer and everyone's got an opinion. Therefore, it can have an impact on. That's them. a really interesting kind of uh, you know kind of turning point that we're getting towards with the fan culture becoming more and more relevant to. The way that it, not only the way that a movie's marketed, but just the way that a movie's put together now. Certainly, and I love how we also call out something that I hate. I think everybody hates to a degree. The, we call out the the trailer bumper, which basically at the start of the trailer, you have that couple second thing where you want to just go into a trailer for the experience, but you always have to be wary of like. Oh, I am so seconds. I am so glad that that uh, that that is not a trend anymore, man. I'm so glad that trend died. That drive that drove me crazy. I would never even want to watch it. I because like you said, it'd be like I feel like it'd be a spoiler, you know, a spoiler mm-hmm. for the trailer itself. And we're looking at trailers as their own experiences at this point. I mean, we talk, yeah. we don't really spend a lot of time. I believe you know, Chris Gore, I think, calls out the trailer for the, someone, calls out, like, we have trailers for trailers now. And essentially, this bumper is a trailer for the trailer within the trailer. So it's nuts. <laughs> it's, it's an inception level trail without the wonks. God. So, uh, so another thing, I think it transitions us, I believe. Uh, yeah, into the. Uh, well, it kind of, it's, yeah, it pretty much it transitions. I love the, um, we make a point about, it's kind of a two-part factor here. Well, one, we have the trailer itself, but we also have the viewing experience factor. Many, again, basically back to the theater experience, where some of the best, uh, the trailers kind of thrive at their best when they're with a crowd, when they're with many people. And we go to the zenith of many people watching the trailer. Sure, sure. So that transitions us to into Iron Man, and of course the Comic-Con slash Hall 8 of it all. Now, Dragon, you're probably going to have more to say about this bit than I do, but uh, yeah, I do definitely remember the zenith behind the Robert Downey Jr. Jr. Iron Man casting, and here's the thing, Dragon, I, from my memory, I was stoked about the Robert Downey Jr. casting from the word go. Like, I don't remember there there being a ton of hype after the trailer, but maybe that was just because I was a little bit disconnected from Marvel at the time. Because you gotta remember, Dragon, and this, uh, this section does point it out pretty accurately, at the time, Marvel was pretty rocky, you know, because we had, like... It started out good enough with uh, with the X-Men and Spider-Man movies. The first two movies in both of those franchise are, franchises are classics. But then after that, it gets really dicey when we get into the mid to late 2000s. Stuff like uh, Spider-Man 3, the Ghost Rider movies, you know, stuff of that nature, X-Men Origins. 
And so by that point, Dragon, I was pretty burned out on Marvel, I gotta say. So the Iron I, I, I definitely remember not taking Iron Man that seriously until the good reviews started coming in. So yeah, that trailer was uh was definitely a good a big turning point. It like like you said, it instantly kind of turned Robert Downey Jr. into a star. Yeah, yeah. So again, chapter five. Yet again, we piggyback off the off the kind of the thrilling experience with the crowd, and basically as we transition to the birth of, of Hollywood at Comic Con, which is kind of what this is all about. Iron Man ushered in many things. One, of course, just in in general, in general, is kind of the birth of the MCU. But I love how we kind of have the uh, not just the birth of the MCU, the birth of the uh, the MCU fandom in a big way here. With again, like this is the first time everyone kind of came together for a Marvel project, just kind of blew their socks off. Anyone was lucky enough to kind of walk into a panel before you had to wait in line to get into a, a panel right. of this magnitude. <laughs> you know, this is when people are like, hey, we got Hall H. Like, yeah, why don't you walk in? Ah. Hall H? What is this Hall H you speak of? So, so again, <laughs> I also, I love like, you know, really nice kind of things within the editing here. Like, uh, I believe, uh, again, my instinct is to go to Gore if, if, if I'm looking for who said it, so just forgive me if I'm just saying Gore. <laughs> I believe uh, Gore says, like you know, these uh, uh, some these conventions are like you know, when when the MCU or, or DC takes the stage, uh, you know, it'll be like a rock concert. We have Loki at the Avengers unveiling is like literally going on stage like he's a rock star, <laughs> just getting you know, heralded by the crowd. And then of course everyone basically again the, the crowd's going nuts. The very base of the whole presentational element of of, of Marvel Studios in in hallway. It's also kind of like bringing back the communal element that was present in the fan in the Phantom Menace days. Like, Hall H is kind of like the ultimate sort of recapturing of that high point. Exactly. And, you know, Mance essentially was kind of talking about the stuff you were about. Basically, he, he kind of tells the story of the Iron Man ingredients of, like, again, there was like, the, there was so, it was such a, all these disparate elements come together. Actor turned filmmaker, uh, you know, actor with a past, and, and also Marvel uh, not not doing that great <laughs> with, with their movies, critically. It's, it hasn't quite <laughs> been coming together for them. Uh, so, you know, we kind of take these elements together and all just kind of, this is a birth of a different trailer. This is the birth of the Comic-Con trailer that we're seeing before our eyes here, which again, brings a lot of, brings a lot from that. Where again, brings the, uh, we take the event thing from home to the event thing of like, you know, a convention, which also transforms the culture of Comic-Con. Because again, Hollywood enters Comic-Con, Tiki, where every, everyone and their mother in Hollywood is bringing their movies, even if they're not comic book movies, to to San Diego, We're Blair Witch with... Dragon, Blair Witch. I know the movie didn't turn out great, but that's one of my most memorable Comic Con moments. <laughs> right, right, but well, you see what I'm saying? It's the copycat yeah. effect with Hall H, where again, of course, that made people kind of. It's kind of people debated as a problem as well, or for the longest time, we're like now oh, Hollywood's invading our kind of our comic laden business. I get the superhero movies there. Why are the rest of the guys there? So it kind of opens a door, but also, you know, it's, you know, we don't know what's going to come through that door sometimes. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's going to be Tom Cruise. That's scary enough. <laughs> all right, so then we go. So speaking of trade, again, the, the again, this one I'm talking about, he's got a really great flow going on here. So we're all about, like, kind of the reactions to one of the biggest trailers ever. So basically the, mo the modern-day Phantom Menace for a whole new genre and everything. Where Star Wars is kind of going on a hiatus for, for roughly 30 years or so. To, well, not, you know, I mean, for a long time. About a decade. I, not yet, yeah, for a decade, I'm thinking back. To, anyway, the point being, Star Wars is on a break. Mm -hmm. Usher in the MCU, which then brings in kind of the MCU from home within the reactions to said trailers, with Chapter 6, Trailer Reactions. All right, so, uh, yeah, of course, Dragon, you and I, we were one of these people back in the day. We did our Steven Universe reactions, which actually kind of, that was, uh, that, those Steven Universe reactions, man, that was, uh, that was one of those things that really did help to grow our channel back in the day. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, of course, we, we still, we don't do reactions anymore, but we definitely still do shot-by-shot uh, -shot breakdowns on our channel, so, oh, yeah, this kind of... This kind of uh, just bleeds into the fan culture thing. It, it definitely bleeds into the, uh, you know, the community element of the trailer watching experience. And it starts to sow the seeds of the idea that, you know, a trailer is more than just uh, an advertisement. It's, it's an art form in itself, but it's also one of those things that, you know, you can just pick apart every little individual detail until you're blue in the face and you just memorize each shot. Uh, I very vividly remember doing that for the Spider-Man 2 trailer back in the day, Trekkin. You know, Tiggy, while that's true and that's great, I still, I, I wish we don't really address trailer breakdowns or like the dreaded red circle effect, you know, which I was kind of hoping I would do with this, you know, like, you know, in this section, I suppose. The red circle effect? 
You know, like the whole like you know, like did you ten things you didn't know? We have like the red. Oh on. yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> which again, that, that kind of springs from the trailer breakdowns. Which again, it's very trailer late and very trailer dependent. So I mean, I'm just I'm just making a leap though. I mean, yeah, we have trailer breakdowns which it kind of covers, but I mean, the red circle is kind of the negative thing that comes from like everyone just being super zeroed in on every little thing, which kind of takes away and kind of like kind of kind of pollutes kind of the grander trailer experience to a degree. It's like uh-huh. it's the ult- it's like the eye roll of trailers. Absolutely, absolutely. Also, there there was one thing. I mean, I kind I I don't know I don't know how familiar um, Campy is with Kevin Smith, honestly. But there was a there was a big lead up to a Kevin Smith cameo that just didn't happen. It kind of baffled me. It was um, <laughs> assuming again, assuming like he is familiar with him. If, if like I, mean, I think everyone's a little familiar with Kevin Smith. I don't, I don't know why. But I'd be shocked if Campy wasn't. At that's least what I'm saying. Because like, I mean, John Schnepp was was tight with Kevin Smith, and of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. What I'm saying is, uh, there's a big lead. Honestly, up. I'd be shocked if Campy hasn't worked with Kevin Smith at some point. That's what I'm saying. I, I, at the very least, I, he's got to at least know about the guy. Mm-hmm. My point is, uh, we have this big lead up. We're talking about the Star Wars fan who gave his own trailer reaction, which he was very, very emotional and crying throughout the video for Rise of Skywalker. And you know, Mark Hamill came to defend him, all that sort of stuff. That's fine. But all that seems like a really extended lead up to. I um, mean, Kevin Smith very famously he had a crying reaction to the Flash. And he does, he does trailers as well. He's, he's been reacting to trailers. But I'm just saying, I, I, maybe that was it. Maybe it was because it was like a whole episode of The Flash. But it was a reaction. And he cried so much, it got him to work on The Flash in the, in the CW, the DCW, <laughs> the Arrowverse, every one of everyone put. I'm just saying a lot came from a, a, a very passionate fan crying over something he loved. I'm just saying, that seems like, it was like, it was like a lot of buildup around that one Star Wars fan. And just like, oh, we're not doing that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a nitpick, but I'm just saying, like, man, that's a lot of buildup for <laughs> just saying. <laughs> anyway, oh, but the Black Panther experience is really cool. So those two, those two guys reacting to the Black Panther trailer, they're initially doing it like a gag and like, oh yeah, we're just gonna like watch and we're gonna be able to dress up like Black Panther in these crappy costumes. But then we're uh, they're just genuinely overpowered by the uh, by the trailer experience. And just kind of they threw that aside. And just, they 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 talked about it. They're talking about the film. It was quite nice. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see, chapter seven, filmmakers and trailers. So this is kind of the start of the Rocky relationship. Uh, it's kind of the predecessor to the, the, the I, I love how we get a whole section of the movie devoted to problems. Yeah. And this is kind of like the uh, the predecessor to that dragon. It kind of sets the stage. Yeah, this is the tipping point for sure. Basically, this sets the stage at least for the next three segments for sure. Uh-huh. And that's, you know, we, one, we're clearing up the misconception. And again, this is a very true misconception. I think Campy was very smart to address Address this because you got to address this in a whole thing about trailers. A big point you got to make where directors, as many of us assume, I mean, you and I at times as well, there's always a question of, at least in the early days, we definitely didn't know about that the directors, many a time, they don't have a say in their filmmaking. Like, and, well, they don't have a say in their in their filmmaking as it's applied to the trailer. <laughs> Try again, that last statement you just made uh, is probably more accurate than you might yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, well, it depends it. on the director. <laughs> but you see, you see my point. The directors yeah, don't, yeah. don't have a choice in the matter of, 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 of the trailers and the marketing uh, today, as they once did maybe in the 60s. And basically, the only... The, this you know, basically you have to be like kind of of the Nolan tier to even have a prayer. Like Do you even Nolan. know anyone besides Nolan who's like actively known for editing their trailers? That's what I'm saying. I mean, I I want to say, you know, I want to. Here's the thing. My instinct is to say Kevin Smith. But even him, I think once he said that no, he didn't put together the trailer. I don't know for uh-huh. a fact. I, that's I know Kevin Smith's very he's very involved in the editing. But I mean, so even then, like Kevin Smith is kind of like he's pretty outside the Hollywood system at that You're point, right. so okay. that hardly counts. Well, I mean, I, a part of me would like to say Mendez, but probably not him, even. Uh-huh. Definitely not with the new Bond movie. That's not him editing, I'm sure. Oh, so, God, no. <laughs> so, I mean, uh... Wait, uh, is, the new Bond, is the new Bond movie still Mendez? I'm I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, I could be, I'll, 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 I could be wrong. I'm just know he's done the last number of them, and so far oh. I haven't, they haven't kicked him off the, uh, you know, the, the thing, so... Like, since Skyfall, he's been doing them. I don't know if this new... I assume this new one is the same. It's the last Daniel Craig one. So, anyway, we're, we're drifting off topic. My point. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't I can't think of an example of him, Tiki, no. Okay. Of someone who might have Nolan S. Cloud. Again, not even... Again, as we know with the Tenant thing. Ten, you know, Tenant, it's, it's it's in the hands of the... Of, of the um, of the uh, aspect guys, it's not even Nolan. So again, it's not even always the case. I mean, Inception presumably is him, but we don't know that for a fact. Right, right. All right, so let's see. So that leads us into uh, chapter eight. Very important thing here: music and trailers. Yes, yes, and again, missing the womp. 
the inception or the yeah body. yeah Why they honestly dragon i think it's probably just a uh, uh you know just a time thing it has to be right because I mean, you know, surely someone's going to think about like, yeah, what's the thing? It's in all, all it's in a large majority of these shows. And again, basically, the, the subheading basically covers what we're talking about, but we don't we don't talk about it, you know. <laughs> Just the, you know, the, the big bomb, bomb, yeah. um, basically the ominous kind of booming sound that we have right. when we cut to black in a trailer, cut back from black in a trailer. Usually in Inception, which kind of basically patented it, which you know, of course. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, this is um, basically talk about how trailer music is a make or break tactic within the trailers, and many times you are kind of nostalgia. We're hitting the nostalgia button in, in our song choices, which is true. All right, you know what? This is going to be my one time to do a. Why didn't they use this? Um, okay. I think the social network was one of the big game changing ones, Dragon. I really do. Uh, the use of the the cover of the Radiohead song "Creep." Uh, God, just an inspired trailer. Absolutely got everyone hyped for that movie. But anyways, I digress. The uh, Of course, they mention uh, the Bohemian Rhapsody for Suicide, Suicide Squad. Uh, what else did they mention? Immigrant Song for Thor Ragnarok. Great, which, great, uh, great, which are two very example. solid uh, solid examples. And I believe uh-huh. at least one of them done by Aspect. I believe Suicide uh-huh. Squad was Aspect. I don't know about Ragnarok, if that was them or not. But uh, Suicide Squad was definitely Aspect, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah, but... Anyway, the point being two excellent, you know, two excellent examples, which definitely again work within the film, especially Thor, because they literally use that in the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So again, maybe again, trailer music was a little lighter than I think the rest of the segments, but again, it was still interesting. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that brings us to nine. Uh, problem. Now we're officially in the problem sake, but again, we're kind of drifting into the problem area. But now we're officially in it with uh, um, showing too much. All right, so this is where we get definitely my, the biggest pet peeve I I ever encountered. And Dragon, thank God I never saw this trailer. I saw TV spots for Castaway, but I never actually saw the trailer before watching the movie. And honestly, Dragon Castaway, like we've never actually talked about Castaway. Maybe we'll have to do it for next Thanksgiving. But uh, Castaway is one of the first movies I can remember that I saw in theaters that was strictly a drama that I got really into. But uh. But yeah, Castaway definitely, uh, definitely an egregious example. Yeah, you can't show him getting back on the plane. That's the dumbest. <laughs> <laughs> you show him reuniting with his wife for Christ's sake. It's just whoever. I mean, that's what. Okay, here's. Okay, here's. I do have. Okay, I do have a legit actual criticism. Well, here, okay, let me be clear. This is not a criticism with. It, it's it's not the film. It's not even the filmmaker. It's kind of the subjects in the film, and this can't be helped. It's just what makes the film interesting. So uh-huh. it's not even a problem within our problem chapter but it's uh okay here's the thing do, do you find it interesting that um this is kind of the debate portion of the film where we have the issue of like you know when is showing when do you show trailers show too much you know there's spoilers with no, i absolutely not uh, yeah because there's several points throughout the next three segments where you know we'll have somebody like really complain like the batman versus superman thing for example sure but well here's my point my point is uh i feel I like that we're bringing up the debate, and that's great. And I'm not. I just. I don't. I don't think it was an editing. I just think like the people who interview just took this side, and they can't really can only do as much as what the people are going to give you. And that the we only had one one branch of people in the trailer business. We didn't get this. I, I don't imagine we got the guys in the in the in the Sony side of things who were making the trailers, which would have been really interesting. Oh, the, the Sony thing is another thing. I was kind of disappointed never got brought up. Which again, honestly. I think that's more so because we didn't get actual guys who from Sony who may have in the past or present have worked. That, you know, so I'm doing that is editing. true. I think that's, that's true. Probably. But I'm just, I'm just saying, man. Like, because they they bring up the Hobbs and Shaw thing when it comes to a movie being over marketed, yeah. and that's fair. But goddamn, man, I have never encountered over marketing like those amazing, the amazing Spider Man two in particular really sticks out like All a right. sore thumb, yeah. man. The the lady with the purple hair made a point that really bothered me. Okay. Okay. Uh, so she she made the old movies argument. Now here's the thing. This is like this is like one of the things where again she they're you essentially all of them, even our lovely guys at Aspect. They are nothing against the Lady of the Purple. I'm just saying with this one point again, it's just what they're giving. It's their thoughts on the matter. I can't I can't really complain about it. But it's that they're you're, they're using the old movies argument that old movies spoiled stuff like crazy, and that's a fact. But 
That's not an excuse. It's not basically that's an excuse, not an answer. That's the difference. Okay, you're not giving me an answer on the matter. You're saying they did it. Well, sure. And they frankly, did it. those trailers are pretty damn boring to watch nowadays. And here's the thing. It's like we're blaming. Uh, here's the thing. Again, I'm blaming the subjects, not the director, on that. But it's just the fact of. You know, the old trailers, uh, like, there's a whole generation they're coming into and not seeing, you know, they're going into the old movies before they're looking at the old movie trailers. You know, they're hearing a recommendation or it's like on a movie list or like an AFI sort of thing. They're not. Like, the old, the old basically using the old movies as, as, as your go-to example, that's not a good example. It's, you know. Sure, sure. That's how I felt. I feel, I wish we broached the issue from both sides or got like another, like a side of like, we're basically the aspect folks, they spin it. And that's, it's not, it's not a bad answer. It's just, they spin it as, uh, you know, it's sub, the answer we kind of get is that it's, it's, uh, due to audience testing where the audience, they're, they're kind of split down the middle of the audience testing or half of them, uh -huh. half of them say you're showed too much. And the other half are, are say, I don't know what this movie's about without realizing, you know, there's a middle ground here. And presumably what happens that what they allude to is that the studios are overcompensating. They don't know what the movie's about. Show it, show more. Well, I mean, that's, yeah. And uh, with the BVS point, real brief, that was one, I guess. Uh, but the BVS point is that uh, you know they're going to team up. That's not a. That's not really a spoiler. Here, the Doomsday is a spoiler, though. That's a Doomsday is a problem. But the fact that Batman Superman going to be friends by the end of this movie that makes sense. I also didn't mind Lex Luthor introducing them. If you if yeah. you remember when I, I when I reacted to that trailer, I actually got really hyped at that moment. <laughs> Yeah, that, they, again, that's like that's what I'm saying. Like, there's certain things that are inevitabilities. Like, I mean, Wonder Woman. Everyone knew knew Gal Gadot was cast. Snyder made a big deal. Like, hey, we cast Wonder Woman. So that's the cat's out of the bag on that. Even if you're not following it closely, I mean, it's like, hey, Gal Gadot. She's probably like the poster at the, the top of the credits. Probably mm -hmm. she's gonna be in the movie. I think people can put that together. <laughs> anyway. So, uh, yeah, so anyway, so, uh, but again, also the, the, the breakup gag at the start is when I put in, like, on Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston's face, the whole, like, you know, the, the, the film fans in the movie trailers, that was pretty funny. Right. Okay, chapter 10. All right, problem, misleading trailers, oh boy. This was, this was, now this thing, this, I think, pulled off the, uh, the things a little bit better in the previous chapter, I felt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um... This has uh, this has probably my favorite reference point in the entire movie, which is Bridge to Terabithia. Yeah, I was really... I knew you were going to love this Bridge to Terabithia. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. Now, Dragon, here's the thing. I will fight tooth and nail for the Bridge to Terabithia movie, all right? Because, like, I, I get the feeling that Robert Meyer Burnett isn't a fan of the movie itself, but, Dragon, I will fight tooth and nail for that movie. That movie is an incredibly accurate version of the book. Like, it, it is a raw goddamn movie, and it got the short end of the stick marketing-wise, for sure. The marketing is an embarrassing, just like, oh, close your eyes and you'll escape to a real beyond anything you've ever imagined. It's like, no. But, Dragon, one thing really quick, I just want to point out with Bridge to Terabithia, because, of course, Robert Meyer Burnett gives the whole thing of, like, you know, imagine you're planning the Saturday matinee with the kids, and then you go home, and the drive home, you have to explain death to the little ones, that's, you know? That's great. That's what I'm saying. This, this had a lot of great stand-up moments with our interview. But really quickly, oh. really quickly with that death point, Dragon, I just want to point out... Do you know who gives the news that uh, that the little girl is dead in the movie? Uh, no. It's none other than Robert Patrick. God. Which I think is great because it's just this iconic, like, dry delivery. Just like, your friend Leslie's dead. And it's just like... You know, like, Robert Patrick, man, it's like, he's terrifying in Terminator 2, and then in Bridge to Terabithia, he's delivering just childhood trauma. Yeah, how much more traumatizing can I get? Let's, let's put him in a police uniform. Let's, let's <laughs> Your make friend him look Leslie's dead. <laughs> yeah, let's just literally make him that Terminator character. But Actually, I'm pretty, I, I might be wrong on this, but I'm pretty sure he, the, he, he plays, uh, he plays uh, the the main character's dad in Bridge to Terabithia, obviously. But I'm pretty sure that character is a cop. He's like a small town cop. Would be I'm weird pretty sure that's the part guy of... off the streets giving bad news to kids. 
I think your friend Leslie's dead. All right, anyways. Who is this guy, Bobby? (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, Bridge to Terabithia, absolutely one of my favorite moments in the whole movie. (laughs) Speaking of which, one of my favorite moments is also in this section, too. Uh, One of my favorite Chris Gore bits in this bit. Uh, Uh He, um... He shares the story I never heard from. I mean, I knew what I knew about this thing from Spider, but I never heard it in this context, which really rocked me. Or Chris Gore, he really very. He says, "I really, I love that he specified uh, the campy. I want this to be in the documentary, which I'm so <laughs> glad he kept this promise there because this is great." Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he talks about yeah. Raimi's Spider Man, the first one, and basically the whole Twin Tower trailer. Where basically there's a little this little trailer you can find on YouTube, I'm sure. Where basically uh, Spider Man captures these guys and uh, these bank robbers in a helicopter between the two towers. And what I didn't know, what we, none of us knew really, is that. Uh, Two million dollars was spent on this trailer, and uh, I never thought of it this way. Raimi, uh, you know, Raimi's used to working on low budget; and he does great things with it. Hence, the uh-huh. dead films. And I never, I never thought, oh yeah, maybe he didn't have as much money as we just assumed he did on the first Spider-Man that he would have gotten in Spider-Man Two and onward. Well, I mean, it makes sense when you think about you it know the first, the first Spider-Man's effects are pretty damn janky. Exactly, and again, it actually <laughs> makes sense. And again, but the idea maybe they could have had like a little extra boost there. Had had based on the two million dollar trailer, they were gotten like, hey, make a trailer. There's two million dollars that we're not you can't use for your movie budget. Uh, of course, nine eleven happens, which means we cannot use this at all. We had to pull everything. And again, this is money that could have gone to the effects budget. Maybe kind of unjankified certain certain elements mm-hmm. of, of Spider Man effects. So again, this is a great. Oh my god, I'm, just, I'm so glad he got that story in there. That's great. Yeah, then, totally. speaking of Spider-Man, we get into kind of the MCU debate about you know, using the fake footage, which uh, I am a fan of the of the way that the MCU dr- does it, Dragon. I am not going to lie. I yeah. think it's I think it's a clever meta game that they play. It is, it is, and I mean, also it kind of helps make the trailer stand out too. Where at the end of the day, uh-huh. it's something different with the trailer versus the movie. And again, so far they've you know they've differentiated with it in like a non-offensive way. It hasn't been like I was really waiting for that bit, but it didn't happen. But again, it's the, the, they've used it purely for surprise, and it's worked out well uh, so far. Um, yeah, oh, my favorite bit, too, I love when he uses Rogue One as an example of trailer shot, not in the movie. I love it has little disclaimers on the bottom of the Oh, Rogue like One is it. awful when it comes to that. It's infamous when it comes to that. That's what I'm saying. I just love this little kind of <laughs> section, kind of like the top ten, like, uh, trailers thing, where it kind of has, like, these little segments of, like, trailer shot, not in uh, movies. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's nice. All right, that brings us to problem, uh, that brings us to chapter 11, problem. Too many trailers. And this is a universal one. This is a, was another great, really great part of the movie here. <laughs> Yeah, Dragon, you know what's funny is that I, my movie theater, you know, before the end times, before everything went to shit, and I don't think my movie theater's ever going to reopen, but back in the good old days, Dragon, back in the before times, um, my movie theater, Dragon, it played like three to five trailers, so I was one of the lucky ones, Dragon, I was one of the lucky ones. Not only did I have a movie theater within walking distance to my house, but it was one of those Archlight style ones where it didn't like jam pack you with uh, with trailers. But yeah, man, that AMC experience is fucking brutal every time I do it. It's like every time I go out of my way to do like an AMC, and usually it's either on, you know, it's either at like a city walk or like if I go to San Francisco. I, I The last time I was at an AMC, I think, was when I went into San Francisco to see 1917. And, uh, yeah, God, it's just, like, AMC is such a corporate, like, you know, John Campion calls them the corporate overlords for a reason, Trekkin. <laughs> you know, it's just, they will just shove everything down your throat, and it's just, it's a problem. Yeah, on my it's, side of the track, they got a theater that, basically, it shows shorter, it shows fewer trailers, but before the trailers, you have gobs and gobs of commercials waiting oh, for the trailers to play, so that that's, bothers yeah. me. But like, again, it's fewer trailers. It's after the runtime, or, or I'm sorry, after the start time? That's what I'm saying, it'll, it'll space it's the same effect, but it's just less good. It's like, not even trailers, it's just like commercials, and like, they're, they're going past the, the start of the show time, and then... Only like two or three trailers at the most. Then it plays. I'd honestly just rather sit through more trailers. To... That's what I'm saying. So you, just, <laughs> you can't win sometimes. Yeah. You just can't win anyway. But uh, yeah, this this whole section's all about uh, you know how really it should be. It's kind of a basically Chris Gore says it should be uh, in terms of the trailers we should get, and I think we can all dance at the beat of this drum. Teaser, uh, official trailer, and then the final trailer. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Three. 
No and uh, in, in theater, we should have three trailers before the movie. Dragon, I'll go as far as to say five is fine. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, five fine. trailers, an average of two minutes apiece, that's about ten minutes. That's fine. That's fine. Ten to fifteen minutes of trailers, fine. We, Dragon, it's kind of like... We're going to use the Olaf's Frozen Adventure Meter here, Trekkin. Anything below 20 minutes, generally okay. Anything after 20 minutes, not great. Right. You know? <laughs> but, uh... Ah, but yeah, uh, I do like the point that Grey Drake brings up, the uh, the purple hair lady, as you call her. Right. Uh, I, I like the point that Grey Drake brings up about, uh, you know, how after... First of all, I really think it's intelligent that she brought up the, the three-act structure of trailers and how trailers are essentially, like, short films in their own right, and it's a lot of mental gymnastics to sit through them all. But then also, just, it, it wears you down, man. It just, it, it makes you lethargic before the movie even you, starts. You've gotten at least, uh, again, at the worst, you've gotten ten movies before the movie you came there for. Right, right. Which again really takes the momentum out of the film you're going to see, which again has a little bit of kind of a like a pseudo kind of effect on your overall enjoyment of the film, which is really sad. I mean, I don't think I don't think I've ever gotten like ten trailers in a row, but it, it feels like that sometimes. But I never really count them. It definitely again. felt like that in 1917. <laughs> 1917, I timed it. There was a solid half hour of trailers, Dragon. I timed it out. I think at the AMC on my side of things, I've been lucky enough to. I think I'm usually in like the at the most the 15 minute range of uh -huh. like of like definitely it's always definitely five trailers. I know that much. It's a question <laughs> it's going to be more than five. Right, right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, it's um, also yeah we. Um, I like how we show we show up like some of the, the theaters that do the three trailer system like Cinerama and again Cinerama has the has that Funko lettering from the fifties which I love, mm -hmm. and uh, and then the Arc Lights again two classic theaters and again again this be a little wistful and nostalgic these this 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 terrible year so you know, <laughs> all right but, yeah all right. So then that brings us to chapter 12. It's all about the moments. So this one, I think what we should do, Tiki, is, I mean, overall, it's, it's, uh, we don't have to go through all the examples unless you really feel uh, compelled to. But uh, Oh, just, I, have, I have personal examples, Dragon. I, have I, think, I, I was going to suggest that we get more <laughs> examples. I we, have them at the ready, Dragon. Okay, well, first off, let's just overall say the thing, and we'll share like, yeah. a few of our trailers. Yeah. So basically, this one's all about, this. Uh, basically, uh, Chapter 12, it's all about the moments, which is absolutely true. It's about the memories, the experience, the hype, the intrigue. This kind of ties things in a nice bow from the beginning thesis to kind of like where we go here. Again, I love how Campy's using like kind of the build-up to the thing. We, we use classic trailers like Wizard of the Clips of Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind to ultimately the end game. Uh, trail, you know, the red and white uh, you know, color scheme teaser, which uh, again is really, really nice, kind of bridging the past to the uh, to the present with films, kind of at its at a big kind of like historical, you know, the history making films and kind of the modern age, which is which is quite nice. And then basically the, the you know the panels kind of talk about you know the trailers that really like that are there like you know the definitive moments that they call to the trailer. Like, what are their definitive trailers? So what 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 are some of yours, Steve? What are some of your definitive trailers? All right, I have a I have a couple blockbusters I'm going to get into, and then I'm going to throw it over to you. And then I need to look up a specific moment from the Social Network trailer just to get it word to word. But I want to get it in there, so I'll, I'll be looking it up while you give yours. But uh, the two that I want to bring up are both from uh, this past decade, Dragon, and they're both for movies that don't necessarily like have the biggest place in my heart in terms of like the actual like how the final movie turned out i don't dislike either of these movies but they were fundamentally disappointments uh so the first one i want to talk about is the second force awakens trailer dragon do you remember the opening shot of the second force awakens trailer uh was was that the john boyega one no, no, no! That was the teaser trailer. Okay, okay. I'm, uh, was that was that Ray? Oh, that, that was the John Star Destroyer in the. Oh, no, I don't know. T, just tell me. The Star De the Star Destroyer. Yeah. Sorry, I should have finished. Yeah. Dragon, that Star Destroyer that captured my imagination like nothing else, man. I remember seeing that shot, that massive Star Destroyer in the sand, and just imagining all the storytelling possibilities, like the Emperor, the Empire has fallen, and the remnants of the Emperor are literally, or of the Empire are literally buried in the sands of this planet. Dragon, the unfortunate thing about that is that when you watch the movie itself, uh, 
there's not really a whole lot of uh, real building throughout the whole trilogy of how exactly that came to be. You know, we're going to see more of that in Mando, thankfully. But, uh, man, I just remember my head just swimming with possibilities of the real building and the storytelling of the post-Empire Star Wars world with that well, You know what I remember up. most from that exact trailer you're talking about? What? It's uh, it's the score at the end of it where we have the uh, we we use my favorite theme from Star Wars. We use Yoda raising the uh, uh, you know raising the X wing from the swamp, and we oh. hear like Dana. It's like the most hyped you could ever be in a Star Wars trailer. Dana, Dana, okay, Dana. Another one, another one from that same trailer is when the Princess Leia, the Han and Princess Leia theme kicks in as the Millennium Falcon like dives into the trenches. Yeah, yeah. Da, 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 da. Oh. Oh, one more, one more, because this okay, is seriously a great trailer. Yeah. Um, uh, when, uh, let's see, when they're saying, uh, uh, so uh -huh. it's, no, 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 the, uh, it's real, all of it. Oh, yeah, that's a great one. Oh, God, uh, still gives me chills, Dragon, still gives me chills. Yeah. Why did they have to fuck up? They did fuck up Han Solo in that movie, but they kind of, I don't know, they kind of reversed him a little bit. Yeah, let's, let's not, let's not dwell on it. We're going to kind of focus on the positive. Here. Anyways, anyways, so my second my second one, this is going to go by a lot faster. Uh, the Dark Knight Rises Dragon. I was so hyped for Bane and the Dark Knight Rises, and one of the big reasons why is the line, when Gotham is ashes, then you have my permission to die. Dragon, oh my god, that the writing on that line, how grim it was... Of course, once again, it led to one of the most disappointing elements of that movie for me, which was the prison. Unfortunately, I thought I thought Bruce Wayne was going to get psychologically fucked up in the prison, but instead it was just kind of a Rocky montage more than anything else. But man, that line in the trailer just uh, ah really, really did it for me. All right, Dragon. What are what are a couple of years, and I'll come back with my ultimate one at the yeah, end. Mine, mine are uh, real simple again. Just on the whole, I mean, the Deadpool trailer, of course, that was a huge moment for me because I've been waiting for that movie for seven years. I mean, I basically, I have the ten year gestation period. I was there for seven of it. So when that trailer happened, knowing having seen the the, the uh, original kind of kind of a uh, lot, you know, the the test footage and just seeing how much of that made in that trailer and just seeing like, I mean, again, I, I was very prideful. I was very, I was, I was. I was excited as I can get. Deadpool's one of the most happy cinematic memories I have. So just that 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 trailer happening in total and just coming out so well and just it was like, like I could have gone home happy just with the trailer again because that movie was like always the myth like oh they're gonna make it they're gonna make it. and just seeing oh they made it essentially in a trailer I could go home happy and then they made the whole movie and I was like how's it getting mm -hmm. then they made a sequel so you, you see where I'm going with this anyway. Um, though he kind of stole a little bit of Dark Knight Rises but not the trailer that really got me though I think you're talking about trailer two for me. The probably the one, one of my go to trailers along with Deadpool, like the one of the best trailers I ever think of. Always mm -hmm. think of it's Dark Knight Rises trailer three. It's the uh, it's it's the trailer where we have it's the most artful of the trailers. You know, we have like there's a storm coming, Mr. Wayne. So oh, yeah, forward to it like that one. It's like the score is everything. It's a movie, it's, like a, it's the ultimate, it's the most, it's a great build up. The Hans Zimmer score is fantastic. The moment that always like always chokes me up when I'm watching it, I love so much. Like one was definitive Batman once in the movie, it's still great in the movie. I'm saying that never, never paled in comparison to how this trailer did the trailer's like a short ultimate testament to batman and the obstacle is going to go up with bane we have all these great money shots but it's when catwoman is saying uh you know you've you, you've given them everything and mm -hmm. batman says not everything not yet it's like yes it's like that's <laughs> That's Batman again, like Gordon looking up at him very stoically, and the whole he comes out of the darkness when the flares lit. It's all there, and like you know, and just again, I I can go on. The point being, that's that's f uh, fantastic, and is ultimately uh, uh, another the, the thing that predates Deadpool for me. Uh, Toy Story two is like was my blockbuster. I know it came out in November, but it was my summer blockbuster, <laughs> and that trailer. Um, you know, the whole the toys are back in town. You know the whole boys are back in town thing. It was like that was uh, was some some great marketing, and uh, I was I mean how can you be any more hyped? And it was like the the event of, of that of that year. All right, all right, uh, Dragon. One more on my end, the social network, and this is my as good as it gets trailer. This is the trailer that just there. There's one moment in this trailer that just still, honest to God, just haunts me. Just genuinely haunts me. And, of course, that's the trailer where we have, uh, I think, the best use of a dark cover song ever with the uh, 
a, a cover of a song that's already pretty dark, Radiohead's Creep, with the children's choir. And Dragon, throughout this whole trailer, it's kind of building, 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 you know, the drama, the tension, you know, like, it, this says we stole Facebook. Well, did we? And then uh, Dragon, the moment, it's, it kind of comes about midway through the trailer, and much like as good as it gets, it's kind of like one of those transitional moments where, like, after this moment, the uh, it really notches up into high gear with the music and the intensity. It's uh, it's uh, Mark and Eduardo having their argument, and, uh, and Mark's like, uh, you know, if you don't get with this, you're going to get left behind. And Eduardo's just like, what do you mean, get left behind? And, oh, God, that right there, Dragon, just the, the pathos of that, that says everything about the social network in one moment. You know, it's just, it's just everything about why that movie works as well as it does. And then, like I said, after that, after that line, it just gets more and more intense and ramped up and emotional. Uh, we see the shot of Eduardo smashing the computer. Uh, I, oh, God, I vividly remember that trailer. All right, guys, we're trailing off here. Trailing, trailer, get it? So the point being, the whole you know, twelve ends very fittingly on a high note of the experience, the notions of you know good, bad. It made you feel something. That's what it's all about. So final thoughts. Final thoughts. I mean, well, obviously we've sat here for seventy minutes, kind of dissecting this thing. So I like it, Trek. You know, I think it's a, uh, you know, it, it's genuinely one of the best documentaries I've seen this year, uh, and I think this is going to be one. I proudly bought it on Amazon because I could tell from the first time I rented it that I definitely was going to be watching this over and over again, and I think this is going to be one of my go-to documentaries on my rotation now, Dragon. I really do. It's it's compulsively watchable. That's the poster quote for me, Dragon. Compulsively <laughs> watchable. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, final thoughts for me. Um, again, I'd love to see more uh, documentary work from Campy. It really impressed me here. Um, it's very polished. Uh, yet another solid documentary for 2020. Again, I mean, I, 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 let me, again, uh, Happy Happy Joy Joy the Rents New. So that's the, that's the Amadeus of animation documentaries. It is. Like, it is. It's so hard to top that one just because that one is like the Frost Nixon of the animation yes, industry. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, to be fair, I mean, of the animation documentaries at least, and there's some good ones. That's a big yeah. one. Um, so, again, yeah, just good. Anyway, but this this is great though. This is uh, so I mean, we are kind of hurting for some like really some really kind of top tier documentaries this year, and basically in the fact that that like a lot of things have been kind of on hold because of the whole Sundance of it all and the whole releasing of these documentaries. So, I mean, stuff like this coming around is what we need. So we need we need a documentary like this to kind of keep us long the orange years and happy happy joy joy as I said. So this uh, you know it, it makes sense again as I said earlier it makes sense to address the trailers when. Uh, Especially now, we're all, all we're doing is waiting with bated breath on trailers and for the promises of things that will come. And, uh, it, it, yeah, and just, we're always clambering around them, so it's nice to actually ask the question, like, why is the trailer special? Why do we care? Isn't the trailer, like, kind of enough in itself sometimes? And you know what? Documentary makes a case for it. Good stuff. All right. Good on you, Campio. We liked <laughs> it. We liked it. Okay. Release the Campia cut! Yes. <laughs>